Well, welcome everybody. I'm Danielle Miller. I'm the director at the Talking Book and Braille Library, and we're really excited to have you here to celebrate our 90th anniversary. And I want to introduce Tyler Kay, who is our patron registrar and outreach specialist, and he is also our resident historian. So we're really delighted to have him share with us today some of our great history. So Tyler, take it away. Well, thank you, Danielle. I will be popping in and out of the screen sharing because there are some gaps where we don't have pictures to go okay. along. Um, but uh, this is what we see is kind of the first of a number of events that we'll be having this year to celebrate the 90th anniversary of the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled, um, our, one of our two parent organizations. And when I talk to people about the service, many people are often surprised at how long we've been around. Um, you know, when you tell them that there's been a talking book program for, you know, 90 years, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, very surprising to a lot of people. And in fact, here in Washington State, our services of uh, uh, library services to the blind and uh, print disabled have been around for 115 years, actually. So let's take a step back and kind of look at how we got to that point of starting services. And the early services... Uh, early efforts at library services for the blind in the United States were humble at first, you could say. Um, the first was likely at the Boston Public Library. In 1868, they had acquired eight embossed volumes of reading material and began circulating it. And over the next 30 years, uh, libraries in other cities such as Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, and Detroit began acquiring and circulating embossed books for the blind. Um, in 1897, the Library of Congress established a reading room with about 500 volumes. And that's what we see here. Um, it's a you know, pretty simple facility. We have uh, a clerk in the back uh, or a librarian, not sure which, and then uh, some reading room tables for folks to read braille books and a modest collection of uh, braille volumes on the shelf. Um, at first, it was difficult to assemble collections uh, because the the acquiring, uh, producing hand-copied Braille was quite expensive, and there were multiple systems of embossed lettering in, in use. I should mention this photograph dates to about 1919 or 1920. Some of the systems of uh, embossed lettering that were in use include moon type, uh, which was a system of raised kind of abstract lettering, and New York Point, which was a system of dots that's uh, different than Braille. It's kind of on more of a horizontal axis, you could say the dots are laid out on. And then there was uh, the English Braille that we use today and a competing uh, a version that was called American Braille. And English Braille was not adopted as the standard in the United States until 1932. In 1906, the Seattle Public Library, which you see here, the old Carnegie building that was on 4th Avenue, began to uh, acquire its first embossed books. This building was uh, constructed in 1906 as well and is in the classical revival style. And it just always amazes me to see this picture is that the 4th Avenue is a dirt road. Um, it's just you know, nothing like it is today. But the Seattle Public Library was quite a trailblazer in that it was one of the three uh, libraries west of the Mississippi to carry books for the blind in the teens. Um, the others were in Portland and San Francisco. As I mentioned earlier, there was a, a lack of a steady source of materials nationwide. So the library depended on volunteer groups, uh, such as the Seattle chapters of the Red Cross, the Junior League, and the Daughters of the American Revolution to transcribe books into Braille. Um, the Red Cross was uh, quite a leader in Braille transcription on a national level for a number of years. And here's a photograph of a group of women in New York City who were transcribing uh, popular fiction in Braille, uh, all wearing their best hats and uh, sitting in front of their uh, uh, Braille writers. And this is about 1922. Um, again, you know, mentioning that the expense of, and the labor that went into producing all this Braille, uh, Ben-Hur, which was four volumes of Braille, cost $14 to produce in 1915. And that's the equivalent of about $367 today. It was also a, a strenuous process to become a volunteer. Um, in 1929 in Seattle, 
50 women were interviewed by the Red Cross Braille Committee and about 10 were selected for the work. Uh, the materials and teacher weren't located for about another year. And then finally, the class took nine months to complete. Um, so it's, it was not an easy process then, nor is it an easy process now, as our transcription volunteers can attest. This is the uh, Red Cross uh, grade one and grade one and a half of a Braille transcription manual that was distributed nationwide uh, to Braille transcribers for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. Um, as well as to our volunteers here in Seattle. A gentleman named George Bailey, who was an employee of the Seattle Lighthouse for the Blind, uh, taught Braille transcription uh, to folks here uh, for about 20 years, and he was well known for his efforts in that regard. He was also uh, very famous for uh, playing the chimes on the University of Washington campus uh, until he uh, became quite er elderly. He did it for a number of years. Um, also, not only the, the Red Cross was volunteering, you had the Junior League volunteering. And one of the Junior League volunteers here in Seattle uh, was somebody named Bertha Boeing. Uh, you may know her better for her husband's accomplishments as the founder of the Boeing Aircraft Company. Uh, and uh, she had uh, not only transcribed a number of materials, she donated some that she was able to acquire as well. I'll just jump out of the sharing here for a moment. Um, at first, it wasn't an easy task to connect folks to the service. Finding people spread out over this area uh, was quite a difficult task. Um, in 1915, the Seattle Public Library loaned about 329 books to blind patrons throughout Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And to drum up interest, in 1920, they acquired a list uh, of, of blind residents of Washington State. I'm not sure if it was uh, derived from the U.S. Census or if it was some sort of a local source, uh, but they contacted everyone on this list to see if they'd be interested in, in reading uh, uh, material from the library. And by the end of that year, 1920, the circulation had reached 933 volumes to 143 borrowers. And finally, after sort of an ad hoc uh, uh, operation for, you know, about a dozen years or so. Uh, a librarian was assigned to the newly formed blind division of the Seattle Public Library, who was able to work from her dedicated space on the third floor. Her name was Fanny Reynolds Howley. Um, we've uh, tried to find a picture of her. We haven't yet, um, but uh, she was a native of Vicksburg, Miss Vicksburg, Mississippi, and she came to Seattle around the turn of the century, and she would have a 33-year career with the Seattle Public Library serving blind patrons. She also uh, uh, kind of did a little internship at the New York Public Library for a short period of time and then came back to continue uh, working here. During the period following World War I, there was quite a, a recognition of the needs of blinded veterans that have returned back from the war and the need to uh, uh, provide rehabilitation uh, for them on a vocational level and to provide them with reading material as well. And so there had been a, a, a motivation in Congress to provide services on a national level at a more organized basis. And um, in March 3rd, 1931, uh, the act to uh, produce, an act to provide books for the adult blind was signed into law by President Hoover, in part to fulfill those needs of blinded World War I veterans. And that's the anniversary that we're celebrating here that formed the network of libraries that we're a part of today. The bill was uh, sponsored by uh, Congresswoman Ruth Pratt of New York, who you see here. She was the first woman from New York elected to Congress. And it was co-sponsored in the Senate by uh, Reed Smoot of Utah, who uh, was better known as being an apostle of the Mormon church and the co-sponsor of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, which is now considered one of the catalysts of the Great Depression. But we do call it the Pratt-Smoot Act as the uh, legislation that created the service that we uh, work from today. And the act allocated about $100,000 or about the equivalent of a, a $1.7 million in today's currency to the Library of Congress to provide books for the adult blind through a network of 19 regional libraries, which I've put on this map here. 
Um, as you can see, they are uh, mostly uh, east of the Mississippi in the upper Midwest and uh, in the uh, mid-Atlantic states. Um, the you know, next closest library to us that first year was in Sacramento. The library in Portland didn't uh, start for another year or so later. And again, as we mentioned before, at this time, our, the Seattle Public Library had responsibility for serving uh, blind patrons in Idaho as well as Alaska for a number, excuse me, I, I said Idaho, I meant Montana, Oregon served Idaho. So served Montana and Alaska for a number of years. Um, and that was the largest serv service area of any library until 1968 uh, when the service in Montana was transferred out. Two copies of each popular work were sent to each library and one copy of others uh, as many as 500 titles a year would start coming in. So really moving beyond the volunteer model and uh, starting to acquire books that were professionally embossed. The first Braille book that was ordered was Woodrow Wilson's George Washington. Um, this was timely because the bicentennial of George Washington's birth was in 1932. This photograph here uh, from 1932 um, is of a woman reading Braille, uh, probably at the Library of Congress reading room uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, Fanny Halley of the Seattle Public Library sat on the American Library Association committee that chose those first books. So uh, we really had an influence uh, very early on about the service. And you know, in my mind, that's quite impressive considering in those days, you know, Seattle was a very distant locale and to be accepted into something on a national basis uh, is, was quite an honor. Among those first books that that committee chose were E.M. Delafield's Diary of a Provincial Lady, Willa Cather's Shadows on the Rock, and Pearl S. Buck's The Good Earth. While materials came in at a rapid pace from the Library of Congress, the local funding for the program was not immune to the effects of the Great Depression, however. Remember, we're in the middle of a of a very serious financial situation for the Seattle Public Library. Uh, the library received no state funding to administer the program uh, until the 1950s. And uh, it was difficult for them to continue to pay someone uh, to work. And so Fanny Halley's hours were cut in 1932 to three days a week. Um, and she would leave the library that year and then come back in 1937. On the national level, interest was growing in the developing technology of the phonograph. As we see here, Thomas Edison with his initial uh, invention uh, as shown in the late 19th century, um, he wrote of 10 potential uses of the phonograph uh, shortly after he invented it in 1877. Uh, number two on his list were, was the production of phonographic books, which will speak to blind people without effort on their part. This was ahead of the reproduction of music, which we, of course, assume, you know, would be the, 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 the top thing that came out of, of phonographs. That was actually fourth on his list. But you might ask, well, then why? Why didn't this happen sooner? If he invented the phonograph in 1877, why, isn't, why are we in the 30s and we still don't have a, a system of recorded books for the blind yet? And the answer is that Early on, the recording media was very limited. Um, in this photograph, we have a picture of these Edison recording cylinders that are kind of brightly colored uh, and uh, would work with the, uh, the Edison phonograph that they would be attached to. And you could only get about four minutes of recording time on each cylinder. And you can imagine that, you know, a talking book on average is 10 hours or more. So you'd be having a lot of these cylinders. It would just be un not feasible. Nor would the 78 records that old, maybe, you know, grandma or great grandma had in her, her, uh, her uh, living room, you wouldn't be able to play books on those either because they only had about five hours of uh, reading time. Uh, here we see an, uh, a Victrola VV240 and a 78 RPM record that would have been popular around that time in the 1930s. A major development came in 1926. Uh, Bell Labs developed the Vitaphone system. You might remember seeing that from the credits of old movies, the sound by Vitaphone. The Vitaphone was a system of motion picture sound that came on very large 33 and a third RPM discs. 
which so that's that uh, uh, the larger disk with a slower speed allowed more recording time. And that caught the fancy of someone named Robert Irwin, who was the director of the American Foundation for the Blind and is pictured here. Uh, Mr. Irwin was a native of, uh, I shouldn't say a native, he wasn't born in Washington, but he relocated to Vaughan on the Key Peninsula at a very early age and was a graduate of what is now the Washington State School for the Blind. He graduated from there in 1901, and then he went on to graduate from the University of Washington in 1906. Irwin hired an engineer who's seen on the left. His name was J.O. Kleber, Jackson Kleber. Uh, he came from RCA uh, and also worked at Bell Labs. And Irwin hired him to uh, develop a system of talking books based on these new technologies that were becoming available. And he uh, became, he, he made his invention public in 1932. And then at that point, Irwin took it upon himself to lobby Congress to expand the scope of the Pratt-Smoot Act to allow uh, the Library of Congress to produce recorded books. Um, here we see a photograph of a gathering uh, at the White House. Uh, Irwin is the second from left. And in the center of the picture, we have uh, President and Mrs. Hoover. Uh, and then uh, uh, Helen Keller is uh, directly to the right of uh, President Hoover. Irwin faced a lot of resistance at multiple levels, though. There, this is a new, unproven technology. Where do you get these players that, to play these, these talking books you speak of? Nobody has them. Uh, the Braille printing houses felt that their funding would be threatened, uh, that, the, that the focus would be taken away from Braille quickly, and that all the, the efforts would go into producing talking books. We're in the midst of the Great Depression. Irwin had tried to get support from Helen Keller uh, to lobby, and she was initially very opposed. She said that talking books were a luxury. The blind can go without for the present. With 10 million out of work, I am unwilling to solicit money for phonographs. Finally, Irwin was able to get the Library of Congress to come to a compromise that if 5,000 talking books uh, players could be uh, uh, acquired by members of the public on the national level, that they would be committed to producing some books uh, on a trial basis for the initial libraries. And so $10,000 was allocated, which was 10% of the budget of the Books for the Blind program to produce 100 copies of each title uh, in audio. This gentleman, his name was Herman Meyer, he was the uh, uh, person in charge of the program for the Library of Congress. Uh, and he, you know, he, he had a philosophical difference with Irwin uh, as to what sort of books should be provided in talking book form at first. Um, Irwin felt that the collection should include books that the rank and file of seeing people would rush to the library to borrow. And Meyer believed that books that had the imprimatur of the Library of Congress should be of an informing nature, literary classics, books of the Bible, patriotic materials. And so they had a compromise. Meyer got the four gospels, the Psalms, a selection of patriotic documents, collection of poems, and a selection of Shakespeare. They all had to be listed first in any publicity that went out. There were also six popular novels that were included. And those include The Diary of a Provincial Lady. Again, that was one of the first Braille books and is one of the first uh, talking books as well. And uh, Rudyard Kipling, Kipling's The Brushwood Boy and P.G. Wodehouse's Very Good Jeeves. Here in Seattle, four Lions Club chapters came together to gift a talking book player to the Seattle Public Library for use in the library and for demonstrations. By 1935, Helen Keller had come around to the cause. Here she is seen with Irwin uh, with a talking book player, feeling the speaker, feeling the vibrations that were emanating from it. She had become an advocate for talking books and she lobbied President Roosevelt to sign an executive order that appropriated about $211,000, which is about $4 million today, to the Library of Congress for the manufacture of talking book machines. <clears throat> 
Some of them were electric, some of them were hand cranked. Um, this one here at seen at left was a hand cranked talking book player uh, produced by the American Foundation for the Blind in 1935. Um, the, the American Foundation for the Blind uh, had the contract with the Library of Congress to produce uh, talking book players under a, a sort of a, it wasn't exactly a WPA Works Project, Progress Administration project, but it was similar to that and it used similar funding. Um, you see it right, one of the early talking books uh, on disc, The Spy by James Fenimore Cooper. Irwin uh, made it a point that his uh, talking book uh, manufacturing facilities at the AFB used uh, uh, the labor of not only uh, individuals who were in need of work, but also individuals with disabilities. Um, about two thirds of the labor uh, included men with visual impairments, uh, deafness or heart conditions. And these are some interesting photos that I found from a, a Library of Congress annual report. This is the uh, assembly line in New York that was at the uh, AFB uh, facilities there, and you see dozens of people uh, lined up uh, manufacturing the talking book players entirely by hand. Um, very detailed work that went into it. Um, here's a gentleman who's testing a talking book player, the sound quality on it before shipping it out. And here are uh, players being boxed up and uh, prepared to be uh, shipped to the local libraries. Uh, by the end of the year, about 40 Seattle patrons had talking book players, and they could select from 50 titles of, on a phonograph. This WPA project lasted until 1942, and about 23,000 talking book machines uh, were produced under these auspices of this program. I want to point out with the early talking book recordings, how skilled it took for a person to narrate a talking book. This is a photograph uh, from recording studios at the American Printing House for the Blind in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, at left, uh, there's a gentleman who's in a recording booth, a soundproof booth, who is narrating the book. And outside of it, from our perspective, uh, there nearer, there is someone who's running a record recording lathe. And the books were recorded on these wax transcription masters. There were only about 15 or 20 minutes of recording time on each one, but that needle was going down into the wax, and once it was down, there was no going back. It wasn't like recording on tape where you could stop and rewind and, and record over it. They had to get it right the first time around, or that wax master had to be thrown out, and they had to start that side over again. Um, so it was really a, quite, a, quite a skill until the 1950s when they started recording on tape. The, the transition to talking books, it resulted in a market increase in the usage of the Seattle Public Library Division for the Blind. Um, here's a, a photograph of the mailman uh, coming to the uh, Seattle Library, picking up that day's mail. There's sacks and stacks of, excuse me, sacks and sacks of Braille books. And then on a table, there are uh, a number of talking books that are in the mailers that were used for many, many years that are probably familiar even to some of our patrons. Um, it opened up the program to people who could not read embossed type. So it really uh, uh, expanded the scope and reach of this service. In 1938, the circulation uh, here was 20,000. It was a 45% increase over the previous year. And space in the Central Library downtown was quickly becoming an issue for what was primarily a warehouse operation. Um, in the annual report, Fanny Halley uh, stated that we look forward to the time when this division of the work may be housed in a less expensive part of town. Much of the circulation will always be through the mails and free transportation of the blind on streetcars rely, rely, relieves the borrowers of any expense if the library quarters should be transferred to a less busy section of the city. But those pleas for space didn't get answered anytime soon. Uh, as kind of a stopgap measure, uh, in 1940, the uh, Library of Congress finally arranged for storage space at the new U.S. Courthouse on Fifth Avenue, which uh, was across the street from the Seattle Public Library. Um, there's a photograph of the courthouse, which was brand new at the time. Um, that most popular book that year in 1943 
I can, I want to go back one slide here. Oh, back one way. There we go. Uh, there's a gentleman, uh, one of our patrons that was another photograph from here in Seattle of a gentleman uh, reading a Braille magazine uh, with his guide dog. Uh, he's sitting on a sofa. And um, one of the most popular reading materials in 1943 was War and Peace, which was on 119 records on eight containers. So that gives you the idea of the type of storage space that was required uh, by these materials. Not only the Braille books, but the talking books were just to continuing to accumulate. During World War II, uh, the library circulation plateaued at about 26,000. There were about 617 active readers in Washington, Montana, and Alaska. Uh, the number stabilized, uh, Fanny Halley uh, theorized it was in part because of the, the war effort that many blind individuals were gainfully employed for the first time. This is a photograph of a, a lighthouse factory in New York City uh, where individuals were making brooms for uh, Army and Navy usage. Um, Fanny Halley said that some of our good readers notified us that they were not only frozen on their jobs, but they were working overtime. So they just simply weren't able to use the, the library as much as they had been able to in the past. But after the war, uh, the needs were still there of space, and finally they were addressed somewhat by uh, uh, relocating to the branch of the Fremont, or to the basement of the Fremont Branch Library. Um, here we have a photograph of our uh, shipping staff in 1944. Um, a page has a, a, wheel, a um, hand truck with uh, dozens of talking books on them, and then a clerk there is uh, preparing some more behind the desk uh, to be uh, sent out as well. Here's the Fremont Branch Library, which was the library's home from 1945 until 1954. Uh, these quarters were still inadequate though, and it was understood that a dedicated facility would need to be developed for the library once funds were available. Another event that occurred in 1945 was the death of the noted Seattle bookseller, Harry Hartman. Um, he uh, had come to Seattle in 1922 to leave the sight-saving department at the uh, Seattle Public Schools. Um, he was a blind individual himself, and he operated bookstores uh, downtown and in the university district uh, since 1926. And I have a photograph of his, uh, one of his locations here. I don't have a photograph of him, unfortunately. Um, Just one moment here. And there's his location that was in downtown Seattle, a very nice uh, bookstore. Um, anyway, um, Mr. Hartman uh, had served on both the uh, board of the Seattle Public Library and helped organize the Friends of the Library. And his wife was very active uh, in library services in Seattle as well. He also established the Young Reader's Choice Award, uh, which is now in its 82nd year. Um, publishers' representatives on the death of Harry Hartman established a memorial fund, uh, and it was to be used for the establishment of a reading room for blind and low vision users, uh, both children and adults. Another notable library user, since we're speaking of uh, uh, individuals who use the service, um, was an 18-year-old rhythm and blues singer and piano player who came to Seattle from Tampa uh, in the late 1940s in hopes of being discovered by a record promoter in a northern city. In 1949, he lived in January, I should say, he lived in the Central District and played the 1 to 5 a.m. shift at the old Rocking Chair Club, which uh, we have in this photograph here, kind of a modest uh, walk-up uh, brick two-story building. Uh, it was located at 14th and Yesler, uh, in the Central District. A few months later, his first record would be released as a member of a group called the Maxon Trio. Here's the Maxon Trio with uh, their first recording that was made here in Seattle on Downbeat Records. Uh, he would uh, uh, come to the uh, Library for the Blind in January 1949, and Fanny Halley would re uh, note in her ledger uh, her first new patron that year was a gentleman known as Mr. Ray C. Robinson. Um, 
uh, I still have this ledger to this day that they recorded all of the uh, patrons in this book up until about the mid-1980s listing them. And I was just curious, you know, I knew that, that uh, Ray Charles had lived in Seattle for a period in the late 1940s and looked and lo and behold, there he was listed in the ledger that he had borrowed Braille books uh, from the Seattle Public Library. Also, uh, you know, during this time after the war, um, with, with the economy booming, there was a, a $5 million library bond measure that came uh, on the 1950 ballot. And that would be the equivalent of about a $53.6 million bond today. It provided for a new central library and five branch libraries, um, including this one seen here that was on Capitol Hill at the corner of Harvard and Republican. It was the Susan J. Henry Branch Library, a very uh, modern uh, design with a lot of uh, open uh, uh, large windows and kind of a split level um, uh, leading uh, down to the Library for the Blind, which was located on the lower level. This uh, facility uh, was the first facility that was specifically designed for use for the talking book and braille services uh, here in Seattle. It was called the Harry Hartman Memorial Room. And uh, as you can see in this photograph, it was equipped with large reading tables uh, designed to hold braille books at a comfortable height. And there were three listening booths on the premises to uh, use to the talking book players that were available in-house as well. Children's materials were also available as the Pratt Smoot Act had been amended in 1952 to provide services. Here we see a couple of young patrons that were uh, leaving the library with uh, a couple volumes of braille in hand walking up the ramp uh, leading away from the building up to the second level. Leading into the entrance of the facility, there was this railing that ended in a sculpture uh, that was a, a tactile sculpture, kind of an abstract, a, you could say it may be the shape of a bird, um, by the artist Dudley Pratt. And Pratt was known for a number of works on the University of Washington campus, and he was a, a mentor to George Sudakawa, the famed sculptor. Um, this, sculpt this sculpture that was sort of a placemaker, a tactile placemaker in the lobby of the Library for the Blind on Capitol Hill, is still in our lobby today, um, as shown in this photograph. By this time in the late 1950s, the library was serving 1,500 patrons in Washington, Montana, Alaska, and had an annual circulation of about 42,000. The talking book collection was about 7,000 copies uh, and about 14,000 braille volumes. Here is a page of working in the uh, shipping stacks at the Henry Library. Lots and lots of stacks of talking books ready to be shelved and some ready to go out on a cart that he's pushing. As the library increased in popularity, the staffing level stayed the same, however. 1956, the library had two full-time and four part-time employees. There were 6,000 book requests a month, but the staff only had the time to fill about 4,000. Uh, it was a very manual process in those days. Um, here's a photograph of a reader's advisor with a file that they kept for every patron of the library. They would have a talking book topics a request list that had been checked off by the patron. They had to manually pull those request lists, look through to find a book that the patron hadn't read before when something had come in and see if it's in stock and then pull it from the shelf and send it out. So it was a very time consuming process. And they were bringing on about 20 to 30 new borrowers every month. The complaints were very high, probably among the highest among all the libraries in the network. Um, the regional librarian at the time, her name was Florence Granis. She had replaced Fanny Halley a couple of years earlier. She was pleading for volunteers in the Seattle Times in at least two occasions. She was noting the difficulty uh, in finding people who would be interested in something called indirect service is what she called it. That it was helping people who were blind, but not, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. It was helping people at a distance. And the, uh, there was an editorial cartoonist in the Seattle Times that accompanied one of this, the, the articles. It was kind of a cute cartoon. Um, it's got a couple of, I would assume, to be college students maybe that were volunteering. And the uh, young man on the left is shelving a, a large Braille volume. And he says, this may be considered indirect help, but my back is going to ache directly. And there's sweat coming off of his brow. 
And this female counterpart is kneeling down, picking up a braille book, and she says, think of the intellectual satisfaction, though. Still, however, she managed to increase the volunteer ranks through a lot of this public relations, and it went from 18 volunteers in 1956 to 105 in 1959, including these two uh, Roosevelt High students, Jan and Molly, who volunteered at the library in 1964. They're both uh, looking at uh, a talking book record there, um, and they're standing among the stacks there at the Henry Branch Library. Another area that Mrs. Granis wished to improve was services to children. This picture is of actually of one of a, a person that's a patron of ours still to this day, Alco Canfield with her brother. Um, there was a, a donation of a World Book Encyclopedia of 145 volumes, and this uh, photograph accompanied the article that was in the newspaper promoting it. Um, anyhow, the, the, the juvenile materials that were available from the Library of Congress were quite limited. Uh, the juvenile books were only about 1% of the collection, but children were about 10% of the library's patrons. So Mrs. Granis made an effort to supplement these materials on a local level. She used gift funds to acquire textbooks and materials for preschoolers, and she worked to get a textbook transcription program established at the Federal Penitentiary on McNeil Island. In 1958, the first story time was held in the Harry Hartman room. And uh, here we have a photograph of uh, four children using the library uh, uh, reading room. And uh, actually a couple of them were seen in the earlier picture um, as well uh, as uh, one in the back there browsing the stacks. One young patron that stood out to Mrs. Granis was an Inupiat girl who lived in Kotzebue, Alaska, uh, which is up in the Arctic Circle. She had, she had come to Seattle to study Braille and learn to read it well. Um, but back home in Alaska, she wasn't able to use talking books because of the lack of electricity. And this was a common problem that the library had in serving the patrons up in Alaska. Um, often the best that could be done was to find a local schoolhouse that had electricity to station the talking book player in and have people come to that central location to be able to use it. Um, Mrs. Granis also told the Seattle Times that she wished to find readers who could narrate books in the local Alaskan dialects. Florence Granis, who is in this photograph here, uh, was served as the regional librarian uh, for eight years uh, before leaving in 1960 to complete her master's degree in librarianship at University of Southern California. Um, her undergraduate degree was in sociology, and she considered this background extremely valuable for her work. She would go on to serve 16 years as the first librarian at the Iowa Library for the Blind, where an award for volunteer service is named after her. Uh, one of her younger patrons in Iowa was Karen Kenninger, who herself would go on to become the Iowa librarian and then director of the National Library Service. In 1960, Mrs. Granis was replaced by Marcia Finseth, who's seen here uh, packaging up a talking book player to be shipped out. She had been at the, uh, worked at the Multnomah County Library in Oregon for a short time before coming back to Seattle, uh, where she had had a career on and off for, a number, uh, for about 10 years uh, with SPL and other roles before coming uh, to the Library for the Blind. She was a graduate of the University of Washington Library School, and like her predecessor, her undergraduate work was in sociology. Her uncle was also an avid user of the talking book program. And during her time in the 1960s, there was a great deal of technological change for the library. Uh, the, the, the media had been pretty static for about 30 years, but finally there was technological change. And the, the program began to transition to talking books that were, were recorded at slower speeds. The first being 16 and two thirds RPM, which was introduced in 1963. Um, we have a, a disc of the Family Book of Preventative Medicine, uh, on 16 RPM, and a variable speed AE4 talking book player, uh, and uh, which uh, was, was uh, used with the 16 RPM records as well as the older 33 and a third RPM records, and then the newer ones that would come a few years later uh, that were 8 RPM. The slower speeds more than doubled the recording time on each disc. It reduced the number of discs that were required, reduced expense, reduced storage space, and allowed the program to uh, produce more materials to distribute to patrons. Also in 1963, the library produced, or excuse me, the library purchased uh, 
its first tape recorder. Um, and the Zeta Phi Eta Speech Society purchased two more. Uh, here, a member of the Zeta Phi Eta is recording a book on a reel-to-reel -to -reel tape on one of those recorders in 1964. The volunteers recorded books of regional interest and supplemented the national uh, materials that were provided by the Library of Congress. So this was really the start of the excellent local recording program that we have today. Um, also in 1967, the library took over machine lending uh, from the state services for the blind, which had uh, had responsibility for those tasks for a number of years. So it brought both the equipment and the books into one facility at the library. In 1969, in an unexpected move, the Library of Congress produced, uh, purchased 10,000 cassette tape players at very short notice and distributed them in roughly equal proportions uh, to the libraries throughout the network. And patron interest was very high in these general electric uh, tape recorder and players that were distributed, but there were only 76 tapes available. Um, even after two years, there were only 350 titles in the collection. So cassettes had kind of a rocky start, um, but finally, over time, the cassette collection grew and the Library of Congress began to purchase players that were produced on a custom basis uh, for the program. Um, throughout the 1970s, they had a new model nearly every year. On the left is the C74 talking book player on cassette that was produced by the uh, American Printing House for the Blind. It's olive green in color. And the C78, which came out in 1978, kind of a burnt orange on the right. And then finally in 1981, the workhorse that we used until the end of the cassette program, the C1 talking book player came out. In 1972, uh, all talking books on discs were converted to an eight and one third RPM flexible disc, um, beginning with the book Wheels by Arthur Haley. This format would be used alongside cassettes for 20 years. It was also uh, able to uh, provide talking book topics with an audio version as well, but the flexible disc could be included with the catalog and order form that was mailed out to patrons, which is shown in this photograph here. On the regulatory side, legislation was updated in 1966 to allow services to be extended to people with physical disabilities. Um, so it also, again, expanded the reach of the program. The library uh, continued to grow, even though libraries in Montana and Alaska were, uh, were formed on their own in the late 1960s and early 1970s, there were still a lot of use, a lot of growth going on here in Washington state. In 1970, there were 3,165 borrowers and they were shipped 165,000 talking books. Um, on the photograph on the left, the, the postman, his name was Lyle Anderson. He served the Capitol Hill Library for a number of years, something like 20 years. And he has many, many uh, uh, bins of talking books that are ready to go out in the mail. Uh, if you compare that with the photograph back from the 30s, it's probably five times as many books that were going out on a daily basis. On the right, we have a, a retired Bremerton school teacher uh, who was with her talking book player and a large print version of the same book and a standard print version of the same book to show you the difference uh, in the media that was available. The talking book program uh, received about 700 new titles a year at this point. Combine this with the multiple machine pro formats, the different uh, uh, cassette players that were available, the record players that were available, the, the capacity of facilities that were as needed to hold all these materials was again reaching a critical state. And in 1972, um, uh, the search was on to move from the Henry Branch Library to a larger facility. And that year, the, the King County Library renovated a former United Parcel Service warehouse uh, on 8th Avenue North between Harrison and Thomas Streets. I wasn't able to find a, a picture of it from the 70s, but I was able to find a photo of it uh, in its days uh, after it was first built back in the 50s as a UPS facility. And then uh, shortly before it was demolished about uh, five, six years ago. This uh, building was leased as the King County Library Administrative Service Center. And there was some additional space on the Harrison uh, Street side that was available. 
And so the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, as it was called at this time, uh, leased that remaining space and moved there in March. Uh, the new chief of the Library of Congress's Division for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, a gentleman named Kurt Silke, who many of you probably are aware of and was uh, in charge of the service for a number of years, he said that the Seattle facilities were ahead of many parts of the country in terms of the physical plant as well as the volunteer operation. And this new location not only offered more space for the existing services, it included for the first time a break room and a loading dock. And it also provided room for expansion into new areas besides just the shipping and receiving of materials. Through the combined efforts of the Seattle Public Library, the Washington State Library, the Northwest Foundation for the Blind, Lions Club, and other organizations, uh, the program called the Radio Talking Book Service began broadcasting in March of 1973 over a subcarrier of KUOW-FM for about 15 hours per week. This uh, photo is of the studio that was in the building on Harrison Street when it first opened, kind of a very modest facility, just a mixing board and a cartridge player and uh, a LP of waltzes. I guess they would have played that in between uh, times. And in that first year, 81 volunteer narrators read uh, selections from books, newspapers, and grocery ads to over about 500,000 households that had receivers, uh, with specially tuned uh, receivers that you see here in this picture, uh, with this couple that lived in Tacoma, they had the radio talking book uh, receiver on their coffee table. And uh, the uh, uh, wife has a uh, braille book that she's reading along uh, as well. And um, there's a, a dog on his lap and they're both uh, listening to the broadcast. By, the 80, by October of that year, the broadcast would fill over uh, 86 hours of airtime per week. Um, in December 1975, Governor Dan Evans and Seattle Mayor Wes Ullman made formal proclamations recognizing this service. And there was an hour long televised concert held on Channel 11 by the pianist George Shearing. Uh, he came to town to raise funds for the Radio Talking Book Program. And this is a photo of his uh, album that came out that year entitled My Ship. In 1975, the library also assumed the local audio and braille transcription activities of the Northwest Foundation for the Blind. Also in 1975, the program began to formalize on the national level in terms of funding the program and the Washington State Library assumed formal responsibility for uh, services of library services for the blind and physically handicapped and contracted with the Seattle Public Library to continue operations. State funding had been sporadic since the mid fifties, but now there was finally dedicated state funding. And at that time, the name, since it was a state service, uh, changed from the Seattle Library for the Blind to the Washington Regional Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. Uh, as part of that immersion into the state politics, there was a bit of a tussle, however. In 1977, uh, the state services for the blind uh, emerged from DSHS to an independent commission uh, that was appointed by the governor. And one of the proposals that emerged at that time was to uh, move the library, from the blind, uh, library for the blind's operations from the auspices of WSL to the new commission for the blind. And that was very controversial. Uh, the Seattle Public Library Board of Trustees uh, and the Washington Library Association both opposed it, and it was finally tabled. As we get into the late 1970s and the, the outreach is ongoing, uh, there's over 6,000 patrons statewide at this point. Also that year, Jan Ames, who had been with the library since 1969 was named the regional librarian and she would hold that position for 23 years. One of the first tasks that she had to address that space was again becoming an issue. The lease on the location on Harrison Street was coming up in 1983 and where to relocate the library to. One proposal included the uh, former Navy transmitter site at Sand Point. Um, which is uh, now the site of the little park there that's at the end of the Burke Gilman Trail. Mayor uh, Charles Royer had envisioned a health village that would include a facility uh, for the library for the blind and physically handicapped on those grounds. It, was, it would have been a $5.5 million facility. Of course, in the early 1980s, economics dictated that that wouldn't be possible. 
And so the search had to, to find somewhere to go um, that would be suitable and would accommodate the library for years to come. And a facility that had been recently uh, vacated on 9th and Lenora that had been the SL Savage Dodge dealership for a number of years had been vacant about not starting about 1979, 1980, and uh, it was up for lease. And uh, so the, the library moved into that facility in early October, 1983. It took about two weeks to move all the facilities and equipment and books there. And it was quite an interesting in, uh, undertaking. There's photographs of it. Um, they had uh, staff and volunteers as well as personnel from the Washington National Guard. They uh, made the move of a half a mile of these books and equipment. Here in this picture, we have a, a number of boxes that are loaded up and ready to go in the talking book collection there. And there are some people uh, milling around getting ready to uh, start loading materials into the trucks. Um, here's the National Guardsmen. Uh, they're sort of beginning a pep talk um, before they're ready to load up these materials uh, for the big move. Also, I, I think it's interesting to see on the lower left, there are the carousels uh, that they used to store the patron files on uh, before the library was computerized and those were getting ready to be packed up and moved as well. So they loaded everything up, moved it down the street, and in this picture we have a, 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 a National Guard truck and there's a couple of National Guardsmen uh, unloading a, a desk out of the back of the truck and hauling it into the building. And probably most notable is the Seattle skyline is uh, not nearly as built out as it is today looking down Ninth Avenue. Not only were the personnel from the National Guard, there were also uh, Painters Union volunteers that worked on this move as well. And in November of 1983, 600 people attended an open house. Uh, also that year, or I should say shortly thereafter, early 1984, the library installed its first automated circulation system and it revolutionized the ability to serve patrons. Um, here is Reader's Advisor, Alan Benson, who had started with the library about that time and he's still with us today. Um, he's a very young man there, very handsome. Um, more patrons could be served on a daily basis with the automated system and uh, through the eventual use of refreshable braille displays, blind employees could perform all the circulation functions um, as well through uh, synthesized speech and the braille displays. Circulation jumped by 45% that first year with the new automated system. Um, so even as the budget cuts, reduced the reader's advisory staff from four down to two, they were able to increase the circulation that they were able to handle by automating that process of selecting the books that would be mailed out each day. Jan Ames said that automating the circulation system was probably one of the most significant changes in the history of the library. In 1985, the Braille program would be reestablished with the, fire, with the hiring of two full-time staff. Uh, one of them is Ed Godfrey, who is in this photograph here and is with us today still. Um, he's at an early uh, computerized uh, uh, Braille transcription software program that he's looking at and has uh, some copy on a copy holder at right. In 1988, a summer reading program would begin and a children's reading room would be established the following year. In the mid 80s, at the federal level, there were multiple attempts to challenge the free matter for the blind mail classification. This posed a significant threat to the service. In 1985, there was a recommendation by the Reagan administration to charge commercial rates for all subsidized classes of mail. This would have crippled the operation of the program. Uh, nationwide, though, there were pressure uh, from users of the libraries and, and Congress preserved the allocations. By 1990, the library was serving nearly 12,000 patrons, over 500,000 items per year. Here's a shot of the exterior of the library on the, the uh, corner uh, display windows with the Washington Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped sign uh, decal on the windows. That name would change in four years in 1994 to the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library. And in 1997, State grants would be used to remodel the uh, building at Lyons and Lenora into a space designed specifically for library operations. This is an architect's rendering of the exterior of the building 
uh, before that remodel. And here's a photograph of the building uh, overlooking uh, uh, Lenora Street and the Space Needle at background. It made the facility uh, accessible uh, with uh, lower uh, uh, customer service desks to comply with Americans with Disabilities Act requirements. And uh, we have a patron here who is receiving books uh, from Rocio Franklin or Rocio Vargas and uh, Alan Binson. In 1999, the NLS Web Braille uh, download site inaugurated, marking the beginning of the program's transition into the digital age. Uh, here in this picture, we have uh, our former staff person, Yuri Swalski, working with a patron at a, a refreshable Braille display at a computer station. Uh, since 2018, electronic Braille downloads have exceeded the physical circulation of Braille. This, the benefits of uh, reduced space, instant access are quite amazing. In 2003, the physical circulation of cassettes peaked. Uh, the total library circulation was over 530,000. On this picture, we have uh, Rick Slama in the uh, audio stacks, Gail Hunt uh, pulling a couple Braille books, and Sally Jo Hagen at a, a computer terminal. In 2006, the National Library Service uh, began a pilot project called the Braille and Audio Reading Download, or BARD website. Um, that first year, 262 patrons downloaded, or excuse me, 262 books were downloaded by Washington patrons. Today, in uh, the year 2020, in our most recent year, that number stood at nearly 150,000. So the program has just really taken off. Um, here we have a gentleman who's using uh, the BARD website um, to download books. In 2008, the Seattle Public Library and Washington State Library agreed to transition the operation of Washington Talking Book and Braille Library directly to the state. At that time, about half of the library's existing staff stayed on and about half uh, new staff was brought on, including uh, Danielle Miller, who is seen uh, second from left in the photograph and sort of a changing of the guard ceremony. Gloria Leonard, who is the regional librarian uh, after Jan Ames is at left. Uh, third in the photo is uh, Jan Walsh, who is a state librarian, and Jan Ames at right. An even bigger change around that time came to patrons in the form of digital talking book players. And here Danielle is with our first shipment of digital talking book players that came in in 2009. And uh, Danielle and Sally Jo uh, went to the home of a, a couple of veterans and presented them with players in person. And uh, here's one of those uh, veterans who uh, enjoyed the use of that player. The first uh, 12 months of the digital talking book program, the circulation stood at about 35,000. Uh, today, that number is about 340,000. Um, that year, in 2009, the library also made its first locally produced audiobooks available for download, becoming the first library in the network to do so. Here we have a local volunteer narrator uh, in our recording studios uh, with the uh, computer waveform monitor in back and she's seated at a microphone uh, reading book. Also that year in 2009, which is just a very auspicious year, uh, the library was named the NLS Network Library of the Year, uh, in part because of our local audio recording uh, uh, activities. And here are Danielle, Jan uh, Walsh, and uh, Sue Amateur, who was of the Patron Advisory Committee, were with Kurt Silke of NLS, accepting the award in the Jefferson Room at the Library of Congress. Uh, the library, again, would be recognized in this manner in 2016. Uh, so far, Washington Talking Book and Braille Library is the only library in the nation to have been recognized with this honor twice. And in 2013, the BARD mobile app for iOS devices was released with an Android app to soon follow. Uh, today, the majority of BARD users access the, uh, the service through mobile devices for downloading. Here we have a very happy patron who has downloaded a book onto her iPad. So as you can see, we've come a long ways from those first records that went out in 1934. Uh, but one thing that has remained true through all, those, all that time is the dedication of the staff and volunteers to provide this service. And the impact that it has on patrons is a constant. I have seen letters that were written in the 1950s 
by folks talking about how appreciative they were of the service and they're very similar to uh, the letters that people would write today. Uh, and I'll leave you with this letter to the editor that was written by a patron of the library, wrote this letter to the editor of the Seattle Times in 1971. Uh, her name was Rosanna Burton and she lived in Seattle. And she said, dear editor, when so many brickbats are flying about the heads of our st state and national elected officials, I would like to speak a word of praise a for a function of government that affected me. After many years of teaching in the public schools of this state, my eyesight began to fail and I could no longer see the children's faces or do the paperwork except at too great an effort. So I resigned. The sight condition is irreparable, but the help I have received from state and national agencies permits me to still be an informed person. I'm referring to the Library of Congress and the state and city library systems. They send through the mail talking books, which I return the same way. These books are read by extremely well-trained voices with thoughtful expression. They are recent books and books of nonfiction in any field. I am sure you are aware of this, but many people are not. I was not until I went to the library looking for books in large print. After then, the library people directed me to the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. So to Governor Evans, who has a responsibility in this area, I want to say thank you. As someone remarked to me, a government which does this kind of service for its citizens cannot be all wrong. And I thank you for listening. Tyler, thank you. That was fantastic. Yeah. Just absolutely wonderful and thank such you. a rich history. I hope everybody enjoyed that. We're just past three. Um, we can just hang on a, a minute or so if anyone has any questions. There was one question in the Q&A. Um, what kind of Braille reading education was there in Washington? Um, I know the Washington State School for the Blind opened in 1886, um, so there would have been Braille instruction there. I imagine there were the equivalents of the, the Braille instructors and teachers of the visually impaired um, that were working with students as well. Um, I don't have any specifics um, other than that. Um, at, the, at the library, there was a lot of, um, uh, of, of, of kind of volunteer tutoring that went tutoring? on in those okay. early days, yeah. That's great. It was sort of a hub for that. Okay, great. Thank you, Tyler. Well, I see some thank yous here and some great presentations. Um, we really appreciate it. Again, this is recorded. We'll get this on our Watable YouTube um, and share that link. If you want to share it with anyone that you know couldn't make it. And we will have more presentations coming throughout this year and be continuing to recognize our 90th anniversary. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming and have a great afternoon. Thank you.